in. This is a new venue for us, and I'm not sure everybody from the medical school kind of knows where the business, the new business school is. Um, my name is Michelle Barry, and I'm the senior associate dean of global health. And Iran Ben David is my co-partner in this seminar series on multinationals and the impact that they have on global health. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our inaugural speaker for this seminar series, um, Sir Richard Feacham. So Sir Richard has had a very illustrious career. Currently, he's executive director of uh, the Global Health Sciences and the Global Health Group at UCSF. From 2002 to 2007, Sir Richard served as founding executive director of the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria under the Secretary General of the UN. During this time, the Global Fund grew to become the largest health financing institution for developing countries. With assets of $11 billion, supporting 450 programs in 136 countries. Sir Richard also served in many other capacities, and I'm just going to summarize a few of them. Um, from 1995 to 1999, he was the Director for Health Nutrition and Population at the World Bank. He's also has been the Dean of the London School of Tropical Medicine, Chairman of the Foundation Council of the Global Forum for Health Research, Treasurer of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and he was the founding director, actually, of the Institute for Global Health Sciences at UCSF and UC Berkeley. Professor Beecham holds a Doctor of Science degree in medicine from the University of London, a PhD in environmental health from the University of Wales. He's a fellow of the Royal Academy, he's an honorary fellow of the American Society of Tropical Medicine, elected member of the Institute of Me Medicine and National Academy of Sciences, and in 2007 he was knighted. And just this year he won the Sir Frank Whittle Medal from the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, his talk tonight, I asked Sir Richard to give an unusual talk. Um, his talk tonight is called Reengineering Aid, an Old Agenda for 21st century. Um, I think with his career and his perspective, he can give us insight into what I would affectionately, because I'm a child of the 60s, call the um, industrial complex of age <laughs> and the inside of this industry uh, and how it impacts health or how it actually may not impact health. So thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. Let's rescue my coffee. Well, thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you all. Um, you now know in exaggerated detail who I am, and I have no idea who you are. So let me just start with a little survey. So hands up anyone born in a low-income country or a middle-income country. And which countries were those? Ukraine. Argentina, okay. Hands up those who have worked in a low-income country or a middle-income country. Great, now let's quickly he hear some, some of the countries. May, the one you've worked most in. Indonesia? India? Uganda? Mexico? Mozambique? Tanzania? Any more hands went up? Yes? Sudan, South Africa, Rwanda. Okay, so that's great multi-continental experience. Very good. And I, th those of you who put your hand up for the work experience in a low-income or middle-income country, were you working in some way in the business of aid? W was your purpose developmental? Would that be generally a yes? Hands up? Be pretty much a yes right around. Yeah. Oh, we didn't ask you, Michelle. <laughs> Many countries. Um, okay, well, that's, that's a good background. And please let your experience come out during this discussion. Um, what I want to talk to you about and hear your views on, and I do encourage you to interrupt me. Uh, there are too many slides. Move quite quickly through them. Um, but um, do stop me with an important point or a clarification. And then, of course, we hope to have lots of discussion time at the end. What I want to talk about is aid, the business of transferring 
money and technology and ideas from wealthy and fortunate countries to less wealthy and less fortunate countries for the purposes of development. Let's call that business aid. And I have to learn how to advance the slide. There we go. And the aid industry um, is roughly 60 years old. Um, its birth is the end of the Second World War, and particularly the period of decolonization. If you go back to the colonial period, these transfers in both directions were mediated by the process of colonialism. And it's really the period of decolonialism that sees the rise of the aid industry and the organizations that we're familiar with that do the business of the aid industry. And the aid industry key institutions are divided into the bilateral institutions and the multilateral institutions. And I should say um, uh, at this point that I'm going to concentrate mainly on a part of aid, which is called ODA, Official Development Assistance. There are other parts of aid, such as some of what Oxfam does, for example. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about official development assistance in which we, the taxpayer, or taxpayers of the wealthy countries, give money to our government, and the, our government uses, with our approval from time to time during elections, to spend some of that money for the purposes of development. And there are two ways that our government does that, and every rich country government does that. There are bilateral um, organizations that are supported in this way, and there are multilateral organizations. Let's start with the multilateral organizations. They came into being um, in the late 1940s and the 1950s. The grandfather of them all is the World Bank, and the World Bank's first loan was to France. So the initial lending of the World Bank for development was to reconstruct war-torn Europe and to reconstruct war-torn Japan. There were big loans to Japan in that period as well. But then, of course, the focus uh, became on the developing world and the low- and middle-income countries. Um, many other prominent multilaterals, we've got UNDP here, UNICEF, um, and uh, the World Health Organization. But then we also have the bilateral structures. Uh, USAID is the one most familiar in the United States. Um, we have DFID here, we have SIDA for Canada, we have JICA for Japan, we have NASI for Sweden, we have NORAD for Norway. And these are the organizations that take these tax dollars and spend them bilaterally on programs with individual countries. So we have that multilateral way of doing business, and we have a bilateral way of doing business. It came into existence in the late 50s, 50s, 60s. And as I'll say later, it changed very little in the 60 years since this apparatus was uh, created. Now, this period that I'm talking about from 1950, shall we say, to the present day, a 60-year period, has been one of spectacular successes. And I want to just make clear how um, dramatically human welfare in the world has improved in my lifetime. Not in most of your lifetimes, but still happening in your lifetime. In my lifetime, there have been very spectacular uh, improvements. Poverty has come way down. Life expectancy has increased more in the last 50 years than in the previous 5,000 years. Absolutely remarkable. And fertility has come right down and continues to come down. And during this period, again, I say, and in my lifetime, the world has largely changed, or Homo sapiens has largely changed, from a high mortality, high fertility existence to a low mortality, low fertility existence. And this is something that will occur only once, we hope, in the total history of the species, the total history of Homo sapiens. This transition will occur only once. And a big chunk of it has occurred in my lifetime. The rest of it's going to occur in your lifetime. There are further reductions in fertility, which will happen, and further um, uh, reductions in mortality that will happen. 
but the process will happen in total over only about a hundred years out of the many, many thousands of years of the existence of the species. So this is quite remarkable. But the question I want us to think about this afternoon is why this has happened. This is very good news. This is spectacular progress. But why? And in particular, was it because of aid? Was it irrespective of aid? Aid didn't matter. It was going to happen or not happen, and aid was irrelevant. Or was it despite aid? If we hadn't had aid, these things would have happened even faster and with even greater magnitude. So I want us to stop and think about that puzzle because there's a very easy assumption that these reductions in poverty, increases in life expectancy, reductions in fertility are very much aid-driven. We, the generous people of the United States and the generous people of Europe, have somehow caused this to happen through our aid in these many, many developing countries. That's an easy assumption to make. It's one that I have often made and will explore um, what evidence there is to support that or support some other position. Let's start with a quick overview of this official development assistance, this part of aid, big part of aid, which is us, the taxpayer, giving money to our government, which then either chooses to spend it bilaterally or give it to a multilateral institution that spends it multilaterally. And we see here the period 1960 through to the present day, so the period in which this industry has existed. And total aid in today's dollars, that period, about 3.5 trillion. So that's the total magnitude over the whole period cumulatively, about 3.5 trillion dollars. And we see two lines here. We see um, the blue line, which is uh, total ODA per year in constant 2008 US dollars in billions, rising from about 40 billion uh, at the beginning of the period to uh, about 122, 123 billion today. So in constant billions of dollars, aid has gone up. But the red line is the generosity line, not the volume line. The red line is aid as a proportion of the GDP of the countries that are giving the aid. So it's a measure of our generosity. Do we give a big proportion of our GDP as aid, or do we give a stingy and smaller proportion of our GDP as aid? And the red line measures that. And you can see that it's down. This is very much the effect of decolonization. And then it was flat, and then it dipped, and now it's rising. And the percentage there that you'll all be familiar with is 0.7%. Many years ago, a target of 0.7% of ODA to be spent on development was set internationally. Some countries signed up to that, some countries didn't. And we'll look in a moment at how close uh, we are and who's there and who's not. Overall, we're at 0.3 something. Goal is 0.7% of our rich country GDP to be spent on development in low-income countries and low-income countries. So these are the generosity lines for some of the rich and just look at the right-hand side. Don't look at the left-hand side, just look at the right-hand side. You can see there are two kinds of countries. There are the generous and there are the less generous. The generous are at 0.7 or above 0.7, and they're all Scandinavian, plus the Luxembourgians, I don't know what you, what you call someone from Luxembourg, um, plus Luxembourg and the Netherlands and those to their north. Denmark, Sweden, Norway. They're at 0.7 or above 0.7, and in most cases it's legislated, so it cannot be otherwise. It's not an annual battle. It's in law that aid shall be 0.7 or higher in those countries. And there are three examples there, Sweden, Denmark, and the Netherlands. And then there is the rest, who are down 0.1, 2, 0.3% of GDP. And the most generous of the rest is the United Kingdom, that's a story I'll come back to. And the US has traditionally been among the least generous in terms of percent of GDP, although rising recently, rising under President Bush and rising under President Obama, we don't quite know because Congress hasn't yet made up its mind on these things, but certainly the intention was to continue to rise. Um, and 
many of these countries, but not all, have fired to the 0.7% target and have said, we're going to get there, uh, just give us the time and we will uh, get our percentage up. But the global financial crisis has certainly put a, a black cloud over that intention. Now, what's the conventional wisdom on aid? I think it's well expressed by the Secretary General of the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris, which is the rich, the rich country club. And they play a role, actually, in oversight of ODA. So they know a lot about ODA. And the Secretary General, um, in April of last year, said, aid is a vital investment with big returns for the world as a whole. And lots of other people say generally similar things. Here's a generally similar thing. The vice president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Aid is a crucial tool for building goodwill, creating a rich cross-border web of organizational and personal ties, and shaping young minds. These are big statements. I've made many statements like this during my career. And the question we should explore is, are they true? They sound good. I think that was all true. Maybe it is. Let's explore further. Now, behind those very optimistic and proactive statements about aid is good and we should do more of it, lies a very heated debate among economists, econometricians, development experts, development policy people. And we can think of this debate as a boxing match. And in the red corner, and I'm using my colors in the UK way, not in the, in the US way, so I'm color confused. But in the red corner, or the left corner, have Jeff Sachs, um, the strongest exponent and the most um, visionary, I think, exponent of the view that aid is good and more aid is better. And he's written at great length and acted essentially on how we should do the more and the better. And in the opposing corner, the right corner or the blue corner, there is Easterly, looking suitably skeptical in that photograph. And his position, my words, not his, would be something like aid doesn't work, and on occasions aid does harm. And they and others are slugging it out in the marketplace for ideas. And there's a very rich literature from them and many others, which does uh, uh, that widely polarized debate. But in, that, in the environment of this debate, there are things which I call inconvenient truths, which we'll talk about a little bit. There are two umpires, Steve Radlett on the left and Paul Collier on the right, wise men with central views in this debate, well-nuanced views, who I encourage you to read. And then increasingly, there are the voices of Africa that we haven't heard much previously. Africans speaking for Africa about, is this helping? We want it. Do we want more of it? Do we want it differently? Do we want it to change in some way? And I'll come back to um, Dambisa Moyo on the left and John Gitongo on the right a little later. Let's start with the, with the uh, articulate, powerful pro position, Jeff Sachs, um, his most compelling book, I think, is The End of Poverty, Economic Possibilities of Our Time. And a quote which sums it up is, extreme poverty is a trap that can be released through targeted investments. And the more aid argument is, is very compelling. It's, it's a very uh, easy to convey and to believe argument. For example, Roughly, five, roughly 7 million children die per year whose deaths are completely unnecessary and preventable. It would be saved by strengthening simple primary health care. That would cost about an extra $25 billion a year. So an extra $25 billion a year could, under this equation, save 7 million uh, tragic and completely preventable child deaths. And how, how, how hard is that? Well, the Afghan war costs $100 billion a year, and banker bonuses in 2009 were more than $20 billion, and they're going to be much more when the 2010 figures are in. 
A U.S. annual health care, what we spend on our own health in the United States is $2.5 trillion a year. A 0.005% tax on all currency transactions would raise $30 billion a year, the so-called Tobin tax that some of you will have been reading about. Global expenditure on pet food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You come up with your striking comparison, and the answer is how difficult it be to get an extra $25 billion and to spend it on saving seven million child lives. It's holding us back. On the other side of the argument, Bill Easterly, and he's written widely, the book I would most recommend is The White Man's Burden, Why the West's Efforts to Aid the Rest Have Done So Much Ill and So Little Good. I love the way these people write their books with subtitles that tell you the answer completely. Um, quote, and aid won't make poverty history. Only the self-reliant efforts of poor people and societies themselves can end poverty. So, Bill Easterly's viewpoint. Now, let me run through a few economic truths which permeate this, uh, sorry, a few inconvenient truths which permeate this intellectual space and definitely fuel and influence the arguments um, on both sides and the arguments in the center as well. If you are a macro, excuse me, <clears throat> if you are a macroeconomist or an econometrician, an what you're asking yourself is, do aid flows plausibly correlate with improved GDP per capita? Because what we're really after is per capita economic growth. That is what will drive better education, better health, better welfare. And is there an association between aid flows and um, uh, faster rises in uh, GNP per capita? And that question has been many times asked by macroeconomists and econometricians. There's a large literature on it. It's sometimes called the aid effectiveness literature. And here's just a recent example of that literature, a paper in 2008 uh, by Rajan and Subramanian in the Review of Economics and Statistics. And their conclusion was, we find little robust evidence of a positive or negative relationship between aid flows and economic growth. We also find no evidence that aid works better in better policy or geographical environments, or that certain forms of aid work better than others. And then a rather low-key conclusion, our findings suggest that the aid apparatus will have to be rethought, in brackets, to put it mildly, if you believe that conclusion. Now, there's a big literature here. It would be another long seminar to review all of that literature. I encourage you to get back into it. Everybody comes to exactly that conclusion. But I would say that literature generally concludes in a skeptical, um, not much impact or no impact kind of endpoint. That's typically where that literature comes out. Inconvenient truth number two, achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Um, because it might be, might be uh, encouraging if, although um, the studies I referred to a moment ago have not found a clear relationship between aid flows and overall economic growth, maybe we can find uh, an association between aid flows and more limited development objectives, such as those incorporated in the Millennium Development Goals. Well, again, the literature is mixed. I'm just going to mention one source. There are others. You need to read yourself and arrive at your own conclusions. But here's a study published in 2010 by the uh, Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., CGD. I recommend that source and their website and their numerous publications. They looked at MDG progress in Africa. They identified the best performers on a um, on a combined score across all the different MDGs. And they, they um, identified also the worst performers on this combined score. And they looked at that aggregate performance against the MDGs, and they asked the question, does it correlate with aid inflows? And the answer was it didn't. Now, there's much more here to be exposed and discovered. It may be if you take a much more narrow 
outcome measure, you would find an association. And I can think of two where you certainly would. One is malaria and the other is HIV, and we'll come to those in a moment. But viewed more in the aggregate, looking at the MDGs as a whole, they didn't find an association. And focusing on Africa. Inconvenient truth number three um, is this, it's all to do with corruption, it's all to do with tracking the last dime, tracking the last dollar. And the former head of the World Food Program and the former head of, U, uh, of USAID, Andrew Natsios, is writing very interestingly, um, in this case in a report published by, again, by the Center for Global Development, about the conflict between the development purpose of a bilateral or multilateral agency and the need for accounting for the last dollar in order to keep your parliament happy or your congress happy or your taxpayer happy, that this money is not being stolen. And Andrew is very compelling uh, about what he calls the little understood but powerful and disruptive tension between, in the clash between the compliance side of aid, the counter bureaucracy as he calls it, and the technical programmatic side. In other words, between those who are focused on getting development accelerated, the programmatic side, those who are focused on counting the dollars and making sure none of them get lost or go astray. And that is a major tension, and I'll come later to what may be the only solution to that tension, because if you're going to invest in the DR Congo, um, you're going to expect um, certain things to happen, and that may be true across most developing countries. Um, and the only clear-cut way to get over this problem is cash on delivery for performance. So don't let me get the inputs, let me reward you for independently verified outcomes, and I'll pay you for the outcomes. Now, you're all thinking, I can see ways to game that as well, I can see ways to make that also corrupt. But I think, if, if well done, that cash on delivery certainly has the potential to uh, alleviate a lot of the tension that Andrew Natsios is, is referring to. There's a great quote from the Duke of Wellington that I won't uh, pause on, but he had the same problem in Spain in 1813, but we'll talk about that if we have time at the end. In inconvenient truth number four, why do we give aid to certain countries? I'm going to pick on India because I'm India's son-in-law, I'm married to an Indian, I spent a lot of time in India, um, and it fascinates me, um, but I could talk about China, I could talk about a number of countries which are recipients of very substantial aid. And there's a question there that you're hearing more and more and people are writing about, which is why. So India is the largest recipient of UK aid, for example. 7% of bilateral aid from the UK goes to India, by far the biggest single country recipient. It's all the, also the largest recipient from all sources of aid for health. Why? Well, the obvious example is that there are huge numbers of very poor people living in India. In fact, there are roughly the same number of very poor people living in India as living in the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. If you add up those 42 countries, or 40 whatever it is, 45 countries, and say how many very poor people, less than a dollar a day or less than $1.50 a day, and then ask the same question for India, the numbers are roughly the same. So, huge number of very poor people would be the simple answer to why. But let's stop and think a bit more about this. India chooses to spend less than 1.5% of its own GDP on health. An okay figure might be 5%, 6%. The States this year will spend 17 or 18% of its GDP on health. No one advocates that. But between 5 and 10%, yes, do advocate that. India chooses to spend less than 1.5%. Why is that okay? And why is it okay for India to receive so much international assistance for, aid, for health in order that it can maintain this undefensible public policy of spending less than 1.5% of its own domestic GDP on the health of its own citizens? India's defense expenditure is 30 billion per year. India, during President Obama's visit, agreed to buy 10 Boeing 7 C-17 Globemasters. I've no idea what a C-17 Globemaster is, but it sounds scary and it's clearly very expensive because if you buy 10 of them, it sets you back $5.8 billion. 
And of course, to put it mildly, no shortage of local knowledge, science or management skill to solve Indian problems by Indians in India for India. Look who runs Silicon Valley. Why, uh, why are we patronizing India in this way? And aid to India is not additional. If a dollar to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance will take some pro proportion of that dollar out of the Ministry. So there's a fungibility game going on. And the dollar taken out goes who knows where. There's no way of knowing that. If it went to educate women, we might say, oh, well, that's, that's good. We like the outcome. But who knows where it goes? We'll come back to the non-additionality of aid. So there's some real questions to ask about why some countries, which you could argue are wealthy enough and technically competent enough to deal with their own major development challenges, perhaps with some um, uh, technical assistance and scientific assistance um, from the West, why they are such large recipients of aid. And this argument is being fought out now most strongly in connection with China, because China is still receiving a lot of aid, but China is giving a lot of aid too. So here's my inconvenient truth number five, the arrival of China. And this was the Financial Times cover story, headline, front page. On January the 18th, 2011, China's lending hits new high. Funding to poor state exceeds World Bank's stark sign of Beijing's economic reach. So the thing that prompted the Financial Times to splash this over the front page is that in 2010, um, uh, Chinese development assistance to Africa exceeded the World Bank's development assistance to Africa. And if you'd gone back five, six years, China's development assistance to Africa would have been very small. So this is an explosive growth, not only of Chinese investment in Africa and Chinese political presence in Africa, but of Chinese development assistance to Africa. And it's a reality that additional donors, the members of the Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, the Europeans, the North Americans, the Japanese, the Australians, et cetera, those traditional donors have not yet come to terms with the implication of this huge Chinese presence um, in, in Africa and in other low-income countries. Inconvenient truth, uh, oh, we're on the same inconvenient truth. Inconvenient truth number five, um, WikiLeaks has all kinds of uh, merits and can search for things that we don't normally read about in the newspapers. One thing you can search WikiLeaks for is did ambassadors around the world respond to certain events in the aid business? And here we look at how the US embassy in Beijing um, got into discussions with African ambassadors in Beijing about the phenomenon of the massive rise of Chinese investments in Africa. And in a cable back from the US embassy in Beijing to Washington DC, um, the ambassador is saying, China's fast, efficient, no strings attached bilateral approach is popular in Africa. That's judged by his conversations with, Chinese ambas uh, with African ambassadors in Beijing. Um, as is the Chinese preference for infrastructure. Come back to that. American officials fear that US or European interference will slow down assistance and tie conditions to Chinese aid. So the message from Africans speaking to our ambassador in Beijing is we like it. It's no strings attached. It's infrastructure, which by the way, you traditional owners have neglected. It builds roads and railways and ports and electric grids, etc. And when did you last, traditional donors, give those issues a lot of attention? It's several decades ago. So we like the no strings, we like the infrastructure, and by the way, keep your hands off this. Don't want to see interference by US and European donors in our relations with China. Very interesting. And behind that lies uh, a complex web of geopolitical interests and relationships and nothing is as simple as, as a simple statement like that. It illustrates what the ambassador was hearing when he consulted his um, African colleagues. 
Inconvenient truth number six, um, for the Pink Floyd fans in the room, another brick in the wall would be useful. Five countries provide 60% of all ODA. Now, if I'd said that in 1950, when we lived in a bipolar world, a very small number of rich countries and a very large number of very, very poor countries, um, you would have said, well, what's wrong with that? Five countries provide 60% of ODA is entirely reasonable. But in today's multipolar world, with the rise of very large economies that are not um, Europe and North America, this no longer makes very much sense. And mis missing in action, if you like, are the Asian tigers, the oil-rich Middle Eastern states, and BRIC except for China. China is becoming very large very quickly. Uh, others are growing but uh, uh, Brazil, I think, most notably. But if you look at the combined um, development assistance provided by the BRIC countries and the others I mentioned here, it's way, way smaller than it could be by the scale of their economies. Inconvenient truth number seven. Uh, this was a study done by the Institute for Health Metrics Evaluation in Seattle looking at aid substitution in the health sector. One dollar of aid into the Ministry of Health from an international source, could be from bilateral, could be from multilateral, leads to what? It leads to something between 40 cents and 1.1 dollar taken out by the Ministry of Finance from the Ministry of Health. We have something falling well short of total additionality. If we give a dollar, we had thought and expected the total health se sector spending in that country would go up by a dollar. It may actually not go up at all if the Ministry of Finance takes a domestic dollar out. It may go up by only 60 cents if the Ministry of Finance takes a domestic 40 cents out. Issue. I did a press conference on uh, April the 19th in London and has had remarkably little commentary since. Long past in the Lancet for those of you who want to get your minds around all this. And it was met by a deafening silence, possibly because it is a very inconvenient truth. And to just say a little bit more about that, here we have government health spending as a percent of total government expenditure between 1999 and 2006. And some of you will know that there's something called the Abuja target, um, agreed by African heads of state meeting in Abuja in the capital of Nigeria. The Abuja target is for African governments to spend 15% of their government spend, of the public expenditure of the country, spend 15% on health. And there's various reasons to think that that's a not unreasonable figure. And here we track the change in that percentage, which by the way, across Africa is way below 15%, nothing close. But how did it change during the period of economic growth that occurred in Africa between 1999 and 2006? when government resources were expanding, and it was an opportunity to ratchet up the percent spent on health during these relatively good times. Well, the red countries actually decreased their uh, government spend on health. The blue countries increased, good for them. But the red countries decreased, and they are the majority of countries. And this really matters, because the starting point in this is domestic expenditure. This is taking out foreign aid. This is spending your own tax revenue on the health of your own people. The starting point is so low. The starting point may be around $15 per capita per year. In the United States, we spend $8,000 per capita per year. $15 per capita per year doesn't buy a health system that can do very much at all. And so during a time of relative economic prosperity, you want to be ratcheting that up. You want to get to 20 and 25 and 30 and 60 and 70 dollars per capita per year. And here was an opportunity to do that. That opportunity was not taken by about two thirds of countries who actually reduced the proportion uh, spent on health. And now the global financial crisis is upon us and is affecting aid budgets. This will seem a very unwise choice uh, for those countries because the international flows are really, really squeezed. An inconvenient truth number eight is aid doesn't buy hearts and minds. And I won't go into a, an academic exposition of the evidence for or against that position. I will simply 
uh, take the, uh, the easy way out and say, I've worked in this business for 40 years. I have had so many conversations with so many villagers and so many ministers and so many, everything in between, private sector, public sector, the very poor and marginalized, the very wealthy and, uh, and well-educated in many, many countries around the world. And my complete conviction is that aid does not buy friendship with the United Kingdom or friendship with the United States. It doesn't make people like us. Other things do make people like us or not, and aid is not among them. What about the voices of Africa? Um, well, here's Dambisa Moyo. Um, anyone read this book? Great. Um, so her subtitle is Why Aid is Not Working and How There is a Better Way for Africa, a quote which leaves you in no doubt about her position. Aid has been an unmitigated political and economic humanitarian disaster for most parts of the developing world. So here you have a Zambian, um, Oxford educated, Harvard educated, worked for Goldman Sachs, very smart woman, very highly educated economist, writing about aid in extremely negative terms. Now, anyone reading the book can punch holes in some of the arguments but I think we have to sit up and take notice when articulate and well-educated Africans voice this strong opposition to the aid business as currently practiced. Another thing I recommend you to read is a book not by John Gitongo, whose photograph appears here, but a book about John Gitongo, a book by Michaela Rong, who was the Financial Times uh, representative in Nairobi for many years. And she has written a book called It's Our Turn to Eat, the story of a Kenyan whistleblower, and that's John that she's talking about. And uh, it's a gripping tale, and I recommend it to you. And it's about corruption in Kenya, and it's about the aid industry in relation to corruption in Kenya, and it's about corruption in Kenya being passed from one administration to the next administration to the next administration. And it's about what John Gitongo did to try and stop that uh, before he had to flee the country. He's now back in the country, and interestingly, the, the British Minister for International Development, and that's a cabinet position in the UK, has just appointed John to be part of a four-person watchdog for British aid, an accountability group which will scrutinize how British aid is spent. John has just been appointed to that group, which I think is a, a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful choice. And here's a quote from the book. Worried Westerners, who so often seem to fall to a benign form of megalomania when it comes to Africa would do well to accept that salvation is simply not theirs to bestow. And I do recommend that book to you. It may change your view on why we've been doing what we've been doing. But now we come to what I call the two umpires, those two wise figures in the center of my previous slide. Paul Collier first from Oxford. We need to narrow the target and broaden the instruments. And his book, The Bottom Billion, recommend that book to you. And his basic thesis is, indeed, narrow the target, focus on the very, very poor exclusively, and broaden the instruments. Don't think we can help the very, very poor through the traditional aid project mo modality, helping a school or building a clinic or promoting a vaccination program. Let's think much more broadly than that and bring in trade very strongly, and also financial relationships, the banking industry, the availability of credit, all kinds of things that affect very poor people, in some cases more, uh, more positively and more quickly than being the recipient of a development project. The ability to sell my cotton in the face of highly subsidized cotton from the United States. The ability to sell my food in the face of highly subsidized food in the European Union. The ability to sell my sugar in the face of what goes on on the farm where I spent the last couple of weeks, uh, which grows subsidized sugar beet uh, under the soil of England and competes very cheaply with sugar cane uh, products coming from the tropics. That is Paul's uh, argument. Narrow the target and broaden the instruments. Another very wise person sitting in the middle, who until recently was Hillary Clinton's uh, senior advisor for 
uh, development issues and is now the chief economist at USAID, uh, Steve Radlett. And his book, Emerging Africa, published last year, um, how 17 countries are leading the way um, in African development. And a quote from him, aid is not the most important driver of growth and development. It is secondary to capable leadership, give it good governance, peace and stability, and sensible economic and social policy. Others have said that before. Um, Steve Radlett says it very persuasively and on the basis of a comprehensive analysis of the last 15 years of experience of African countries. And that analysis can be summed up in this slide. Um, he identifies 17 countries, and they're all in blue on this slide, two countries, which without being major oil countries, he's taken the major oil countries out because they require a separate analysis because their economic data is always totally distorted by the uh, value of the oil revenues. So taking the oil-rich countries out, um, he finds 17 countries that have uh, an average annual per capita GNP growth of more than 2% over um, a period of 12 years from 1996 to 2008. That's remarkable. 2% per capita in a part of the world where population is still growing at about 3%, 3.5% per capita, because fertility is still higher than it uh, is in other parts of the world. So that per capita growth in GDP is remarkable. 2% sustained over 12 years. The average for all the blue countries for the whole of the period was a cumulative 50% growth in GDP per capita. So if my GDP per capita grows by 50% in 12 years, I have become a significantly more wealthy country. And of course, as my fertility rate continues to fall, these effects will be felt even more strongly. And the purpose of his analysis is to compare the blue countries with the others. What have the blue countries got that the other countries don't have or has le have less of, which might explain singularly powerful economic performance? And he comes up with uh, the following list, democratic accountable government, sound economic policies, which he gives great emphasis to, the end of the debt crisis. So here comes the aid industry doing something really powerful, getting rid of the huge burden on the backs of these countries of debt inherited from previous often corrupt and incompetent regimes. And the big debt forgiveness program in the late 90s and the early part of this century was a significant boost to development uh, in Africa um, uh, according to Radlett's analysis. Spread of new technologies, uh, he finds powerful, and a new generation of leaders in government, private sector, and civil society. The new smart young Africans coming up and taking control of various parts of society, providing leadership. Aid, in his conclusion, played a secondary role in the successful countries and did not rescue the unsuccessful countries. And bear in mind, the unsuccessful countries, the, the ones that were not blue in the map, were also receiving large amounts of aid over the same period. There is a plethora of other challenging books and articles on this subject. Uh, delivering aid differently is one of them. A quote, aid can work, but not if it continues to be uncoordinated, unmeasured, and uncompetitive. And then a radical view on how we should do it. Just give money to the poor the development revolution from the global south. To reduce poverty and promote development, just give money to the poor. Some of you will be familiar with conditional cash transfers, the model pioneered in Mexico in the Progressa program, uh, now being used in other countries. It's become quite voguish, conditional cash transfers, and has got some quite strong uh, evidence to support its impact. But this goes a stage further. This says unconditional cash transfers. Identify poor people and hand them cash. And if you want to know the arguments for and against that, only four, because the book is written by enthusiasts for this approach, um, then take a look at that book. It's, it's very interesting. So I've been hiding behind everyone else's opinion. What do I think about all this, having worked in this field for a long time? I think aid has done much to create focused, irreversible change in the case of smallpox eradication.
question. That cannot be unwound. And I think it's the greatest achievement of humankind probably ever. I put it way ahead of getting to the moon. I think it's utterly biologically and in an evolutionary sense remarkable. And as far as we know, and we certainly hope it to be the case, it isn't reversible. And if we do polio, the same will be true. And if we do guinea worm, the same will be true. So eradicating a pestilence from the planet is aid-driven, unquestionably. These things would not happen without aid. They are very aid-driven. They are irreversible. Great. It's also created focused but reversible change. And for example, HIV therapy, year 2000, in the developing world, zero. No one was on antiretroviral drugs. Today in the developing world, five million on antiretroviral drugs and rising rapidly. Absolutely remarkable. Giving decades of life to people who would otherwise be dead. Millions of orphans not becoming orphans because their parents don't die because they're on antiretroviral therapy. School teachers who keep teaching, doctors who keep doctoring, civil servants who keep running the country because they're not dying, they're on antiretroviral therapy. Massive achievement. Uh, child immunization, another massive achievement. Um, malaria control, malaria down by more than 50% across a large number of highly malarious countries. These are aid driven. These would not have happened without aid, but they are reversible. And that keeps us awake at night a lot, particularly in the global financial crisis. These things can be undone. The people on antiretroviral therapy will die within weeks if the flow of drugs is interrupted. And we have examples where that has happened. Malaria will resurge if the programs slacken off and become underfunded, so on and so on. Children will die of measles again in large numbers if measles immunization is to slacken or decrease. So very reversible, and it's uh, an issue that we give not sufficient attention to. Aid has done little to drive economic growth in, in a broader way or long-term broad and deep improvements in welfare. These things have depended, in my view, far more on the kinds of factors that Steve Radlett enumerates in his book. And finally, and again, this is a very controversial issue. You'll find many shades of opinion. Aid has done harm in some places at some points of time by encouraging and or perpetuating dysfunctional governance and policies. Aid can become um, a safety blanket. Aid can become a fig leaf that can encourage and perpetuate systems that are so dysfunctional, so corrupt, so policy crazy in some cases, that if that aid had not been there, the crisis would have come sooner and those this would have been changed, that president would have been overthrown, that change in governance would have occurred. And from your personal experience, you can speculate about countries that may have been caught in that situation. Now, I painted a, a, a picture of the aid industry in the last 60 years that certainly isn't brimming with success and optimism. I'm raising some serious questions about the impact of the aid industry. So you're thinking, well, if this was a corporation with such low return on investment, and here we think of social return on investment, our investments bought improvements in welfare, social return on investments, the return on investments from aid have been modest, I think would be a, a, a cautious summary. Therefore, we could have expected, surely, that there would have been radical reform and upheaval in the aid industry. Let's do it differently. Let's do it better. This isn't working so well. We must reform. We must challenge ourselves. And extraordinarily, that hasn't happened at all. The aid industry today in the major multilaterals and the major bilaterals goes on very much like it went on in 1965. And there has been extremely little fundamental reform in the apparatus of aid, in the culture of aid, in the business model of aid. What actually happens every day? How do people transact aid? It's remarkably unchanged, and there are only three radical innovators. Um, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, initiated by President Bush and still uh, strongly supported under President Obama. The Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization, and by far the largest, 
global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. These are, in different ways, radical innovators. They do the business of transferring funds from wealthy countries to less wealthy countries in very, very different ways. And there is clear evidence that some of that has been successful. None of it is perfect by any means. Some of the innovations have been less successful or unsuccessful. Viewed in the round, these have demonstrated successes and demonstrated the power of radical innovation, and yet a very, um, a very little taken up by the rest of the industry. And indeed, more worryingly, there is a tendency of the rest of the industry to drag the innovators into the mainstream of practice and make them look more like the rest, which I think through time will make them less effective because at the moment they are more effective than the rest. So what, from the experience of the three innovators, what do most people agree on as being good strategies for reform? Agree on but fail to act on typically. Firstly, results-based financing, uh, cash on delivery. I referred to that a few moments ago. Focus on outputs, not on inputs. Secondly, focus on the demand side. Support their ideas, their programs, their policies with an appropriate quality screen, obviously. Um, but don't dream up priorities in Washington or Geneva or, Lo or London. Dream up priorities and strategies and approaches in Lilongwe and put development aid behind Malawian ideas, Malawian programs, Malawian policies, Malawian priorities. It makes a huge difference. And it generates this rather nebulous idea called ownership, which despite being nebulous and hard to define and hard to measure, I believe is incredibly important. Whose project is this? mine the World Bank project officer? Is it mine the portfolio manager at the Global Fund? Is it mine the bushy-tailed person in USAID dying to get um, um, women's health in better shape in country A or B? Is that who owns this project? Or is it owned by the local NGO, the local government official, the local policymaker, the local implementer. And the success of the project, in my experience, depends hugely on the local ownership. And if we do demand side and ownership right, we begin to create a purchaser provider split, which the Global Fund has done better than anyone. What I mean, separate the financer from the designer and implementer. It's what in the British NHS, the jargon is purchaser provider split the British National Health Service. Um, don't make it the case that the person who's paying for it is also designing it and very involved in implementing it because then accountability becomes extremely murky and responsibility and ownership become extremely murky. Let the financer stand back and say, your policy, your strategy, your ideas, we'll support them. If it's successful, your success. If it's a failure, your failure, and we'll move the money somewhere else. So it's arm's length financing where the financer does not get in engaged in design or implementation. It's the model of the Global Fund, truer on paper than in practice, but much truer for the Global Fund than any other major uh, aid financing organization. Be pro-private sector. It is the private sector, not the government of Uganda or Rwanda or Cambodia or wherever that is going to generate the future improvements in welfare in that country. And we have a horrible tendency in the past to put money into governments that are already bloated and unaccountable. Politicians become accountable to donors, not to their own citizens. Very common phenomena in low-income countries. And we need an investment policy that doesn't crowd out the private sector and indeed encourages the growth, particularly of small businesses, but also of larger businesses. Dual accountability, let the recipient and the donor be really, really accountable for what they do and really transparent. There's only one development financing agency where you can track every disbursement, every report card, every detail on the website, and that's the Global Fund. That's been true since 2003, and that's not a praise for the Global Fund. It's a very strong do better comment for everybody else. It shouldn't be the case. 
that it, only for the Global Fund can you track every decision, every disbursement, um, every report card. It could be true for all development finances. And on the recipient side, we equally need to uh, expect uh, a very high level of accountability. And going with that, extreme transparency. All on the website. No reason for anything not to be on the website. I used to have people coming, coming into my office all the time at the Global Fund saying, well, this is a little too sensitive. I don't think we can put that on the website. The answer was no. Put it on the website. Put everything on the website. And it will generate its own benefits uh, in a very clear way. And long-term and more predictable aid flows. Aid is volatile. Aid is capricious. Aid is unreliable. If you're a recipient, if you're the Minister of Finance of a low-income country, aid makes your life a miserable uh, experience because you are very dependent on it. It's a big chunk of your government expenditure. You can't rely on it. It isn't dependable. You are dependent upon it, but it isn't dependable. It goes up and down in amount, a way that you can't foresee, and it moves around in topic area according to fashions generated in North America and Europe. So suddenly it's women's empowerment, and then it's back to organization, and then it's educating girls, and then it's conditional cash transfers to prevent uh, HIV in schoolgirls in Tanzania, and then it's something else. It lurches. And for a Minister of Finance, it, it makes life uh, very difficult indeed. So longer-term commitments are more predictable. So let me come uh, to close with um, what I'm going to describe as possible building blocks for what aid might look like in the future. Um, I, I'm not wise enough by any means to propose the answers to the sort of questions I've been um, posing, um, but I'm going to suggest some building blocks which, with much other thinking and a lot of uh, work by many people around the world, might create uh, a better aid architecture and a better way of doing this. And this is in no particular order. The first is regard humanitarian disasters as a completely separate business. Don't muddle them up with development assistance. The thing about humanitarian disasters is we know we're going to have several this year. We've just had a huge run in Japan. But we know we're going to have several more. Their existence is not in doubt. And their periodicity is roughly predictable. We don't know where. And we don't know what. Will it be an earthquake, an army, or this or that? But we know there are going to be some. And we know they're going to put the lives of hundreds of thousands of people at risk. And we know we're going to mobilize once again a chaotic response, well-meaning chaotic response, which in some places, Haiti is a good example, we could revisit 14 months later and find continuing chaos and dash promises and hopes. So, I would argue that we should take this thing, responding to cataclysms, out of regular development assistance bureaucracies and do it differently and do it better. And uh, there are some specifics there about what differently and better may look like. Secondly, focus on non-aid development agenda. Um, again, a quote from Steve Radlett, aid is not the most important policy tools Aid is not the most important policy tool rich countries have to influence growth and development. Much greater influence comes through trade and investment policies. Let's take that seriously. Let's come together and agree that the uh, trade agenda and the finance agenda really do affect the um, future um, trajectory of the low and middle income countries. The G20 in South Korea, the major development push was DFQF, duty-free, quota-free. Let the products of the low-income countries enter the markets of the wealthy countries duty-free, duty -free, quota-free. We're a long way from that at the moment. That was not agreed. That was a spectacular failure to agree. It's going to come back again at this G20 uh, in Paris later this year, or in France later this year. Um, but let's focus more energy and attention on getting that part of it right. Um, 
Here's a quote along the same lines. The former deputy editor of The Independent, a newspaper in the UK, we should focus relentlessly on trade and not on aid. Africa does not need saving by outsiders. It is finding its own solutions to its own problems with impressive speed. And his argument presumably goes on to say, and that speed would be further increased if the trade playing field was more leveled. Item number three, innovate financially. More equity investment, less debt, more blending of public and private investments, more public-private partnerships. We could talk at length about each of these, but there's significant innovation possible in uh, development finance, and these are some of the elements that it might uh, focus on. Number four, scale down aid to countries and scale up aid to global public goods. Uh, there's something very compelling about global public goods um, where you need a concerted global multi-country effort to produce a good or to alleviate a bad that would not otherwise occur, that good would otherwise not be produced or that bad might otherwise not be alleviated. And then the benefit of that, the value of that good is available for all. Some countries will adopt and use and take forward very quickly, others more slowly. But the global value added has been achieved. The global public good is out there. We have an HIV vaccine. We, we don't. We're 20 years away from it. But let me give you an example of a global public good would be an HIV vaccine. Some countries would adopt it quickly and effectively deliver it, others much more slowly. But the global value has been, in, uh, has been added, and the investments are substantial and won't occur without a significant public sector effort. Um, an example of a global public bad that we want to alleviate would be um, drug resistance by malaria to the most common anti-malaria drug. There's already a threat on the Cambodian, uh, uh, Thai-Burma border and the Thai-Cambodia border and is spreading and big investments to prevent that global public bad from occurring are a really good way, one can argue, to spend aid money. And I've given some examples here. Uh, new science, technology, and knowledge attenuating existing global threats and preparing for new global threats. And I've mentioned a couple. Fifthly, if we do this, if we move away from aid to countries and think more about global public goods, what about the countries that actually would cease to exist as organized nation states if there was not significant inflows of aid? And there are some countries. This is no attempt to formally define them. But here I'm just looking at very small, I'm sorry, very poor, small countries. And I'm arbitrarily defining those as countries with a GNI per capita of less than $600 per year and populations of less than 20 million. Um, and it turns out that there are 14 countries, such countries in the world, and here they are. And countries uh, like these, um, these countries and other countries which may also be in situations of high vulnerability need, if you like, uh, a new deal with the wealthy countries to give them the financial means that they need to build a better future and eventually to graduate from this degree of dependency. And the last one is the importance of uh, generating leaders. Um, just like the United States, so any developing country needs a broad and deep pool of leaders from which to draw into politics, into civil society, into the private sector. Invest in African universities. We've neglected African universities remarkably. We've argued that primary education matters, and secondary not so much, and tertiary hardly at all. So the trajectory of investment in African universities has been downward and is extremely low. We need to reverse that. Create well-funded long-term co-managed marriages between northern and southern medical engineering and management schools. I think huge value would come from this. Uh, UCSF has such an arrangement with the uh, medical school in Dar es Salaam. And I think huge value is coming from that uh, relationship. But many more of these things are necessary. And open up more development-related fellowships for study in the US or in Europe and support for return. It's not just come and get a world-class degree in Stanford. It's come and get a world-class degree in Stanford, and what happens next? What about your 
um, re, um, um, uh, your return to your home country and your ability to really contribute and, and, uh, and be successful back in your home country. So we need to, I think, rethink how we do that. Just end quickly um, with a word about the global financial crisis. All these issues that I've been speaking about um, would be timely, would be important, even if we hadn't had a global financial crisis. These issues are not because of the global financial crisis. They're because we've been doing aid for 60 years, and the social return on investment has been this. However, the global financial crisis brings these issues into very sharp relief. And some of you may be following the debates in Washington about the, uh, the FY11 budget that is still not agreed and the FY12 budget that is ahead of us. Um, and within those debates is a very big argument about aid and foreign assistance with people ranging from it's got to go up, it's incredibly important, right through to we'll cut it um, because we need to cut it and we don't like it very much anyway. There's a sort of whole spectrum of opinion out there. And these debates about aid effectiveness and how we do the business of aid become much more salient and much more important in times of scarcity of, <coughs> excuse me, scarcity of resources and when there is a big battle over dollars because of the large domestic deficits. And these large domestic deficits apply across the donor countries. And there's an interesting example of this from the UK, which I'll just give you. Um, one way to look at the vulnerability of the ODA budget in a wealthy country is to express it as a percentage of what the same government spends for health or the same government spends for defense. Now, in the US last year, the foreign assistance budget was 2% of the health budget. That's 2% of the public health budget, the government health budget, not the total health budget. It would be about 1% of the total health budget. It was 2% of the health budget and 4% of the defense budget. Low numbers. In the UK last year, it was 8% of the health budget and 24% of, of, of the defense budget. But in 2013, it's projected to be 10% of the health budget and 33% of the defense budget. Now, that is because everybody's budget is being cut in the UK as part of the draconian deficit reduction measures brought in by the new coalition government. Um, but the DFID budget is increasing. So these percentages are becoming very significant. And I think they give you a sense of the local political battle to be fought to maintain such significant percentages going to foreign assistance at a time of undoubted domestic hardship. So I've spoken for far too long and you haven't interrupted me anything like sufficiently, but I will stop and encourage you. Thank you.